Hello, I am Eli Adashi, professor of medical science at Brown University and host of Medscape One on One. Joining me today is Senator Tom Coburn, a practicing family physician and a legislator, now in his second term as the junior senator from Oklahoma. A former three-term member of the House of Representatives, Dr. Coburn brings significant legislative experience to a national health care scene in great flux. As one of three physicians in the Senate, Dr. Coburn plays a key role in all matters health care. Welcome. It's Good to just be with you. wonderful to have you. It's great to meet you. Those of us who marvel at your multiple accomplishments uh, cannot help but wonder if you are still seeing patients and, for that matter, delivering babies. No, well, I stopped delivering babies summer before last. I uh, had a real interesting last case, but I, I stopped just simply because I wasn't doing enough. Uh, and as you know, you start losing your skills. Uh, still doing my continuing medical education and, and occasionally getting to see patients on a Monday morning. That's terrific. Yeah. Last Thursday, you introduced a new bill that is designed to deal with the future financial solvency of Medicaid. Could you perhaps share with our viewers the central ingredients, the high points of that bill, and what drove you to propose this alternative in the mix that is currently on the Hill? Well, uh, uh, myself along with Senator Burns, Senator Chambliss introduced uh, uh, a, a state Medicaid Flexibility Act, basically. Well, and, and what it does is it says, <clears throat> it asks the question first, uh, the reason we did it is, can we do Medicaid better? And uh, <clears throat> should Medicaid be the same program in Ohio or New York as it is in Oklahoma? Uh, are there the same demands? Or, or the, <clears throat> what are the variables that impact a patient in Medicaid? We know a lot of things about Medicaid. Number one is we know most of them have trouble getting access. Uh, we, we promise people coverage and we give them a Medicaid card and then they can't find anybody to care for them. Uh, that's the first problem. Number two is we know the outcomes aren't as good even when you adjust for the different, different social strata and, and, and conditions. So that's really not very much of a promise if we're going to have a federal state assisted uh, Medicaid program. So the, the idea behind this is to, is to transfer the decision making flexibility and capability of helping patients to the people who will care more about them than we do, which is their state. And, and allow that flexibility, allow that creativity to flourish in the individual states. For example, Arizona has a complete waiver. They have, uh, uh, and they're, they're spending less than the average on Medicaid in the country, uh, but they have everybody in Medicaid and HMO. There are positive things to that, there are negative things to that, but basically everybody has a medical home. North Carolina has a waiver. They have a medical home for everybody in, in, uh, in, on Medicaid, and they've made tremendous strides in terms of outcomes and prevention. So what we have is, what we want to do is let the real experiment begin with other people's ideas and send that money to the state and say, okay, you know, we're not going to let you go down, but wherever you want to go forward mm -hmm. in terms of caring for your patients that are uh, impoverished or need help, then go your way. I couldn't help but note that there was a provision in the bill that would compensate providers at a, an improved higher level. Um, is this driven by your earlier comment, namely that access to physicians has been limited? Yeah, what, what we know, uh, there's a couple of studies. Uh, we know right now of primary care, whether it's internist, pedi pediatrics, or family practice, 
forty <clears throat> percent of them will not see a Medicaid patient, and it's not because they don't want to. It's basically it's down to two reasons. One is they can't afford to anymore, given such a large percentage of their practice is is Medicare, uh, and number two is is when patients are seen uh, by specialists, only thirty five percent of the specialists will see a Medicaid patient. So, so the the whole idea is if you want if you want to say we're going to help you, but then you're, we're going to limit your ability to get there through an economic means. Why don't we let the market kind of decide what's available and what's uh, what's accessible in Oklahoma or Ohio or Virginia or wherever? But let's let those market rates determine that. And, and you know, our problem in healthcare, <coughs> Dr. Dashi, is is it costs too much. And what we also know is one out of three dollars spent in health care isn't helping anybody. So when we, we're going to spend two point six trillion dollars this year on health care and eight hundred and fifty billion isn't helping anybody, we ought to start thinking about how do we change the mix to where we have new ideas put into it and maybe more local control rather than centralized bureau, bureaucratic control from Washington. Uh, that bill also repeals the increased number of people going into Medicaid. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the original part of the Affordable Care Act said 16 new, million new people would go into Medicaid. It's now estimated to be 25 million. And I, I would just say, you know, that's a false promise that Washington can't keep. If you enroll 25 million new people in Medicaid, they're not going to be seen. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to go outside of Medicaid to get care. I also noted what I think is a, a, an important exclusion you uh, inserted, namely to forego the application of some of these new regulations to dual eligibles and to disabled. Uh, disabled. Mm -hmm. What went into those considerations? What uh, drove you to make those exclusions? Well, one is, is they're a specialized class. Number two, that they're an expensive class. And if you're, if, if you're sending it to the states, what we do recommend or we give for an option is a managed care option for those individuals. In the states where they've had some experiments on this, they actually save a lot of money when they individualize the care rather than institutionalize the care for these individuals. Uh, so what we did is we didn't want to, we, we have a capped entitlement, which means we're going to control the amount of money that's going to be spent. We didn't want to cap the entitlement on that group of people. Uh, and we don't know enough yet about if you could do that, what would be a fair amount. We know in the other areas, but in these we don't. So for, for the dual eligibles, the very, very poor that are on Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid, and for the, those that, that are disabled, and on Medicaid. What we said is, let's let the states experiment how best to handle that. But here's the money. Let's move to Medicare for a moment. Uh, I understand you're in the midst of preparing new legislation that would address that uh, institutions long-term solvency as well as perhaps operational characteristics. You are bringing to that table your experience with the Cost Reduction Commission mm -hmm. and your recent involvement with the so-called Gang of Six. What, as you think about Medicare today, is your prescription, if you will? What general principles have you formulated in your own mind that would drive the bill that uh, you are hopefully going to uh, introduce? Well, I, I, I think a couple of things are important. Uh, the first is to recognize <coughs> Medicare as we know it today is an impossibility five years from now, just five. We do not have the money to keep the commitments under the present yeah. system five years from now. It won't be there. A and to create an expectation that Medicare is going to be stable without changing it, it is, well, it's just patently dishonest. Uh, there is no way we have the money to afford Medicare to mm -hmm. continue as it is. So, so well, what do we know about Medicare? We, we know there's at least $80 billion worth of fraud in it a year. Some of it physician, most of it not, but some of it is. 
uh, the system's designed to be defrauded. Uh, how do we, how, why do we see such a greater amount of fraud in Medicare than we do in private sector insurance? 1% versus 10%, 12%, 15 18%. Why, why is the differential? What do you need to do to change that? So that's one thing you would do. <clears throat> Number two is how do you incentivize preventive care and disincentivize overutilization? Uh, because we have a lot of that. Uh, how do you make it equitable in all parts of the plan so that a senior knows? Uh, as I've become a senior, one mm -hmm. of the things that I've recognized that I, I had seen in my patients for years is <clears throat> you think about your health more and you think about the future more. Uh, and one of the things that happens is, as a consequence of aging and how we focus on our health and our future, we're v really vulnerable to be to pay out dollars that really don't buy us much back. We, we want that secure. We we want everything over here tied up in terms of our health care. <clears throat> and so, consequently, the American people are exposed to a significant amount of money, uh, either through Medicare or through an a supplemental insurance policy, but probably not in a positive way. So how, how do you how do you tell a senior here's the max exposure you have every year so you can quit worrying about it? You know I'm convinced the supple I, and I did this with tons of my senior patients. I had them bring me their insurance program, and I said, well let's just talk about this. You may have an untoward event, but you're paying five hundred and sixty dollars a month for this supplemental policy why don't you just take that money and put it in the bank? Because here's your exposure, and after two years, you're way ahead of the game, and you don't buy it. And, and I talked probably 85% of my patients out of supplemental insurance because they really get very poor value uh, for what that is, unless they're really sick or really have chronic conditions. You're referring condition. to Medigap. And Medigap, yeah, supplemental uh, policy for Medicare. So yeah. how do we make Medicare to where they, you know, if we have a government-run program, why do you have to buy another program to take care of what Medicare doesn't cover? So why don't we create the expectation that people know what it'll cover, they know what the max, so put a maximum exposure for every senior in this country annualized. So just some of those things. Uh, how do we incentivize prevention? How do we dis disincentivize overutilization? How, how do we make sure we don't overutilize certain services like home health care? You know, it, 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 Home health care is a wonderful benefit, but it's also markedly profitable for the agencies that are doing it. Same thing with hospice. How, how do we get that balance back? And, and so it goes back to what's wrong with health care. What's wrong with health care is it costs way too much first, but the reason it costs too much is because everybody thinks somebody else is paying the bill. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have that disconnect, we're going to have a difficult time uh, ever controlling costs, whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector. It seems reasonable to assume that there will be some cost reduction measures in the bill. Um, what can you say or tell our viewers about the prospect of a revenue component as well in this plan, if any? Well, we have, you know, there's no question our government has a revenue problem, part of it because the economy has not fully recovered. Um, I don't think we have to go there. I think what we have to do is ring out. It, you know, if, if you go, I use this example. When people tell me American citizens aren't smart enough to buy their health care. I don't buy that. You know, I've delivered a lot of Amish babies. We have a large Amish community north of my hometown. Mm -hmm. They don't have insurance, but they're the best purchasers of health care I know because they want to know where every dollar's going. They want to know where they can get something done cheaper. They're questioning whether or not you certainly need to have it done. And so consequently, they buy their health care for about 40% less than everybody else. I mean, because they're great, avid consumers. That's what we need. I mean, as a professional, it really is good if my patient's questioning about why I need a test. Um, and the other thing we need, which it refers to our profession, is we really need to be a whole lot more responsible with how we direct where money is spent. Uh, because there is a finite amount of money in this country for health care. And we've reached the max. We're not going any higher. And so one or two or three things is going to happen for our seniors. 
it's going to get rationed if we don't change it to a, a better model, uh, which means somebody besides you is going to be making the decision, you and your, your physician, about mm -hmm. what your health care is going to be. Uh, and we, we can't stay competitive worldwide, and we certainly can't afford a continued doubling or tripling of the inflation rate in health care compared to everything else. It, we just can't do it. So <clears throat> we have to figure out how best to do that. And I think reconnecting people with making the decision, trusting mm -hmm. that if it's in their own best interest mm -hmm. financially, mm -hmm. they'll make different choices. <clears throat> it's difficult to talk about Medicare today without mentioning the sustainable growth rate formula and the concern that many of our viewers obviously have about impending cuts to their reimbursements. Two questions. Does your to-be-proposed bill address this issue? But aside from that, where do you see this matter going in the current mix? L let, me, let me answer the second uh, first, <clears throat> I, uh, physicians are not going to have a 24 or 27 percent cut. We all know that. Uh, but it shows you the problem of the legislative body trying to handle health care because the whole reason the SGR was put in was to control health care, thinking that if the physicians were faced with this, they'd make better decisions about how they spent Medicare dollars. That obviously didn't work, and we've been trying to catch up with it. <clears throat> but I, what I, I think you can tell physicians is they're probably not going to see any increases mm -hmm. in payment for a number for at least five years, I, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, simply because as a nation we're on our back financially. Uh, so I don't think that's going to happen. They may see a sm small cut, but nothing significant. Uh, uh, and as a physician, I can tell you, you know, dealing with Medicare is really pretty easy anymore in terms of getting pay, filing electronically, getting paid electronically, getting paid on time. Uh, the question is, is can you afford to have those rates in your practice? And that's changing all around the country, so the, the mix is changing. Um, we need to figure out, you know, I've always asked the question, why does the best surgeon get paid the same as the worst? Why does the best internist get paid the same as the worst under Medicare? Wh wh where did we lose market forces? Uh, and we lost market forces when Medicare came in. Uh, you know, we, we, we have transitioned from seeing 25 patients a day and doing a great job to seeing 45 patients a day and not doing what we were taught, which was if you will listen to your patient, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. Well, seeing 45 patients a day, you can't listen to your patient. So we, we have transitioned to a treadmill where we're trying to pay the bills, and it's highly expensive. And I have all these friends that have gone to concierge medicine, and what they like about it the most isn't that they're making more money, is that they know they're doing a much better job. They're ordering fewer tests, they're coming to a, a diagnostic conclusion faster and better, and they're educating their patients and doing a lot of work in terms of prevention that they never had time to do before. In other words, their level of satisfaction overall is much increased. And the, the satisfaction of, of the, the patient patients, yeah, is yes. better. Interesting. So, uh, you know, it, that, it, there's some mix in between there. Uh, we've got to figure out how to pay f physicians right. Uh, and I'm not sure the government ought to be setting prices on it. Uh, a price-controlled commodity if it's underpriced, it's overutilized. If it's overpriced, it's marginalized. So what is wrong with letting individuals decide? Uh, and, you know, where you have the bad actors, hammer. To the extent that you're comfortable sharing this with our viewers, how does your vision compare and contrast with the one that was developed by the House? through the initiatives of Representative Paul Ryan? Well, I, you, uh, you know, I fully embrace what Paul Ryan's trying to do. Uh, there, there's a couple of givens. One is, is it won't continue the way it is. So you have two options. You can go to a, a, a market-based model where people make choices based on their own best interest and interact with the market, 
or you can say no we're not going to do that but we're going to have a fixed amount of money with a growing number of people and we're going to let 15 individuals decide what the pay is going to be well what the projections are under the Affordable Care Act meaning the IPAB or the, the IPAB Independent board, Payment Board the Payment Advisory, advisory Board, board yeah. uh, under the projections from the IPAB board you will get less than what you're paid for in Medicaid uh, in a very short period of time three or four years because that's what's going to have to happen if we don't change things so you know why would we go there why why wouldn't we go and say for, you know, our country was built a, a, a lot of what we were allowed to accomplish. Markets allowed us to do that. And markets aren't perfect. I have no illusions. But they're a whole lot better than a bunch of bureaucrats trying to make decisions outside of a doctor-patient relationship. And I would bet you, uh, in terms of efficiency, overall we'd get better return in terms of health care for the dollars expended versus the way we're doing it today. Uh, so, th th so I, I, I'm encouraged that Paul Ryan would put that out. Uh, you know what that what that well, you hear all the political clamor about it, and they're going to run on it on the next election. But you know it really makes sense. It's untruthful to say we're going to continue Medicare the way it is. It isn't going to continue because the money isn't going to be there. Why not uh, make sure we take care of those that are on the low end to make sure they have plenty of money mm -hmm. to get what they want. Why don't we make sure you have an option to where you can save some money if you're a smart consumer? And if you're very wealthy in this country, maybe you're not going to get as much help. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's not a novel idea. That's a common sense idea that just might work. Otherwise, you know, the Medicare, I, I, it, amazing, I talk to these young people all the time. They don't expect to get Medicare. You know what? They're right. They won't. Hmm. Uh, they don't expect to get Social Security. And I don't think they will. So I, I would embrace uh, what Paul Ryan said. It, 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 look, I would much rather individuals ration the care of themselves. You know, here's what I envision. It's not just the iPad board. It's the Innovation Council, too. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes, the CMS uh, Innovation, innovation Council. Council. But they're going to say what you can and cannot have access mm -hmm. to. What new innovation is available to Medicare? Well, that's nothing but a rationing technique as well. So when you say iPad board's going to say here's where we're cutting spending and the Innovation Council is going to say here's the limitation on new treatments, uh, I think Americans would probably rather be able to choose that themselves than having a limited number of people in Washington choosing that for them, regardless of how well-intentioned they are or good they are. Uh, and, and matter of fact, I know that. I don't think that. I know that, uh, that Americans would like to make those decisions. Shifting gears now, Senator, to another issue that is obviously on the mind of all physicians and you as a practicing family medicine uh, practitioner as well as an obstetrician gynecologist would be very aware of, and that is, of course, the malpractice challenge and the notion that perhaps we can reform uh, our medical liability situation as we speak. What is your general vision on that matter? Could you support a bill such as the Health Act proposed by Representative Gingri? Um, do you think of this as a federal matter as opposed to a state matter? What can you share with our viewers given really a life experience both yeah. as a practitioner and as a legislator yeah. on a thorny issue. Yeah. Well, uh, it is a big issue. Uh, uh, defensive medicine costs at a minimum are $200 billion a year in this country. Uh, and you're, if where, where you've seen significant tort reform uh, like Texas, California, uh, and others, Mississippi, <coughs> What you've seen is not only have you seen malpractice rates go down, but after about two years of that, then you start seeing practice patterns change. Uh, uh, and it really does. Oklahoma just passed a tort change in my home state. We've been trying to do it for 25 years uh, where there's a limitation on non-economic damages for every act, not just health care. Every act in our state of $350,000. Well, th that's going to draw business to our state like crazy. Uh, 
because you know what the, the game that's being played can't be played on you. Uh, what I worry about, and, and as a fiscal conservative, what I, and also kind of a constitutionalist, I worry the first time we put our nose under the tent to start telling Oklahoma or Ohio or Michigan what your tort law will be, where will it stop? In, in other words, if we can expand the Commerce Clause enough to mandate that you have to buy health insurance, then I'm sure, I'm sure nobody would object to saying we can extend it enough to say what your tort law is going to be. But then we're going to have the federal government telling us what our tort laws will be in health care, then what about our tort laws everywhere else? And, and where does it stop? Uh, you know, one of the things our founders believed is that the 13 separate states could actually have some unique identity uh, under this Constitution and can maybe try things and do things different. Uh, and I think we ought to allow that process to continue as long as we're protecting human and civil rights. Uh, so I'm real happy about what Oklahoma's done. I can't believe any state wouldn't do that. Uh, but one of the things is, is it's okay to fail. Uh, I don't like the liability system. Uh, I had a bill last year, our uh, uh, Patient's Choice Act, which incentivized the states to change. In other words, if you'll either put up a health court or you'll go to uh, 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 a system where you actually reform it, then we'll supplement your Medicaid payments. Uh, in other words, we'll incentivize you to do that, and that's, I think is the better way to do it. How do we get you to do something that's positive in the long run for your state? You know, when, when you break down that $800 billion, a quarter of it is us ordering tests. We know we really don't need. You know, when I first started delivering babies, we didn't do ultrasounds unless there, we had a suspicion that there was a problem. And, and I would tell you that, you know, what's the average pregnancy have today? Four ultrasounds on it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the outcomes are a whole lot better. Uh, and yet, why are we doing that? Uh, a good reason that we're doing it is to make sure we don't see something there that because there's an ultrasound machine may not change your action and certainly a lot of times won't change the outcome, but now we've documented it. Um, uh, I'm not sure that helps us. We have indirectly discussed today the Affordable Care Act, mostly through some of the revisions you're thinking of. Are there elements of the Affordable Care Act that you did find useful, constructive, helpful in any way? Could you get behind one or more elements of the bill? Or have you found the bill more or less across the board troubling? Uh, I, I, as a practicing physician, I find it tremendously troubling because ultimately what we're going to do is withdraw decision-making between patients and physicians. I mean, that's the long-term direction of this bill. Uh, I like some of the accountable care organization ideas. I think we can do things a lot better in medicine if we do them together. The teamwork yeah, notion. Uh, but the regulations they put out, the 220 pages that nobody's going to want to now comply with, it just shows you what happens. You know, doctors aren't putting those regulations out. Lawyers are. And, and what we need is some common sense applied. We can take a good idea and make it a disaster up here all the time when we run it through a bureaucracy. And so I think, but look, I actually believe that we, we can't, we're, we're spending enough money in medicine in this country. I think we can get a whole lot better care for a whole lot more people with the same amount of dollars. But I don't think the way we do it, uh, which is central to the, the Affordable Care Act is through centralized command and control bureaucracy. I think, you know, it's the same thing you do with children. You incentivize good behavior and you punish or disincentivize bad behavior. And what we need is transparency. We need transparency as to price in health care. We need transparency as to uh, outcomes. Uh, we need to quit kidding ourselves uh, about what we can accomplish and what we can't. We need real competition in the pharmaceutical industry. Right now, what we're, what we're doing is, is through our policies in this country, we, we supplement and subsidize everybody else's drugs in the world. American taxpayer does. 
as well as the American consumer. We ought to, we ought to be about changing that. If Canada tells us that our, our companies can only sell at a certain price, we ought to tell them what we'll pay for their lumber. I mean, we've not ever had an aggressive approach as far as pharmaceutical cost in terms of our international competition. And so what happens is we ultimately pay a whole lot more here than everybody else does around the world because we're subsidizing the research and we're subsidizing uh, the ability for the next new product to come online. So I th the, there's no question healthcare is broken, but I would put forth healthcare really got broken when the government started getting into it. If you go back and look at where the healthcare inflation started, go back and look to it. It started in the mid 60s, after Medicare started, mm -hmm. after we had a system that said somebody else is going to pay for it. And we've been trying to constrain costs ever since. It, right, but yeah. but you're not going to, when, when my purchase, if I, if I go to the grocery store and I purchase the groceries for this week and I've bought an insurance policy that says, here's my copay, I, everything else I can go, I'm going to be a totally different consumer than if I know it's coming out of the wad of uh, $5 bills that I have in my pocket that I've got to pay and I've got to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. Well, it's human nature, and we keep kidding ourselves that this is something other than markets. Is it more serious? Yes. Is it life-impacting to a greater degree? Yes. Can we, in fact, trust individuals to make a great decision for themselves, and can we trust physicians to actually go back and do what they're trained to do? My biggest worry is in our educational institutions today is that because the government has now said, here's the limited time you can learn as a resident, we're, we're actually putting these constraints in terms of real practical experience on our residents, and now we're putting constraints on what they can earn. Uh, you know, it's not going to be long where you're going to have fewer and fewer of our top minds going into medicine. As the Affordable Care Act and its various proposed substitutes are being debated uh, in Congress, there's a parallel process going on in the courts, as you know. And while you're not a lawyer or a judge, um, have you formed an opinion in your own mind as to the constitutionality or appropriateness, at least, of the individual mandate as a principle? Yeah, uh, I have, and it's probably obvious to you. Um, as I look at our total government, one of the things I've seen is this slow expansion of the Commerce Clause to give the federal government more and more power, uh, which in some times it has been good, there's no question. But most oftentimes, the, the good that has come from it has been very expensive and very costly. Uh, look, if, if the individual mandate is upheld, in other words, the federal government can force you to buy something against your will. Mm -hmm. um, I think the time uh, for our true freedom in our country is limited uh, because there, it, there will be no constraints on this Congress or any other. If, if that's the rule of the day, uh, then we can tell you what kind of car you're going to buy. Uh, we can tell you you can't buy a Cadillac, you have to buy a, you know, a Chevy mm -hmm. uh, because we're, we're selling Chevys over here this month, so you have to buy that. I mean, th there's just this whole range that mm -hmm. w this is such an expansion in the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause was originally expanded over a farmer who wanted to raise wheat for his chickens in Wisconsin, and yet the wheat board wouldn't let him raise wheat. So he challenged it, and he lost. And so we, for the first time, we had a federal government telling what a chicken farmer couldn't raise his own feed for his own chickens in Wisconsin. Washington said that and the Supreme Court upheld that. Well, that was the first expansion of the Commerce Clause, and if you look at it, what we've done is we've continued to grow it. And I think as, as the Commerce Clause has been expended through an example of the individual mandate, uh, our freedom is less. And, and so it worries me about the vitality of our republic when we can t expand the Commerce Clause to that extent. On a personal note, if I may, you are a two-time cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. How can we best proceed in dealing with this major worldwide challenge? 
Would you like to see cancer legislation as part of your legacy? Uh, what are your personal wishes and hopes in this arena? Well, I think, you know, the science is so expanding now, molecular science and genetic science. It, it, I mean, it, it's amazing what we're seeing. I, I guess my hope would for us to be able to redouble NIH funding again, uh, to take it to $60 billion a year, to, you know, to really bring it up there where we, we really put the dollars. Uh, <coughs> uh, you know, I, I, I was diagnosed with melanoma as a young man, given a very poor outcome was fortunate and had great physicians. Uh, I had uh, metastatic colon cancer as in my 50s uh, uh, and, you know, had a 50-50, five-year survival. Uh, the medicines, the treatments have, have so improved. You know, 20 years ago, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so I think that I don't want us to specifically tell research scientists what they have to do. Because quite frankly, we don't know. Uh, Congress doesn't know. What we ought to say is put the minds, put the brains, put the experience, and say, guys, here's some goals. You go do it. And I routinely fight disease-specific legislation up here because right now we're working at molecular level that has benefits across all sorts of disease spectrums and all, co all courses of fields. And when we start limiting our researchers and our scientists, by saying you have to lock down over here, uh, let them go where we can get the best benefit. Let them go where they can see it. So I'd like to see us do that. And we could do that if we would pull in some of the rest of the federal government. So enabling rather than micromanaging. Yes. And if possible, doubling the NIH budget yeah. to $60 billion when and if this becomes possible. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. On that note, sincere thanks to Senator Coburn and to you, our viewers for joining Medscape one on one. Until next time, I am Ellie Adashi. Mm -hmm.